Sanbonani, good evening, Dumelang, and welcome to the Tuesday edition of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. It's episode 126. You know, I absolutely cannot get over how many episodes we've had over the past few months. And of course, as usual, I want to hear from you. Perhaps what have been some of the episodes that have stood out? We've been on for 125 episodes. We're now on 126 episode. Which have been some of the topics that you've really, uh, you know, learned a lot from and probably gone back to that episode to rewatch it and rewatch it so you can learn new nuggets. Do let us know down here on our chat box, whether you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. And of course, as usual, we're bringing you all things relating to property. And this time around, we're talking finances. You know, I always say that when you get the gist of how property is financed, certain things begin to make sense. It isn't just about the feelings. It isn't just about the view. It really is about getting a grip on the financing part, not just you as an individual, but also, of course, when you do the actual deal. But this time around, we're actually going to be looking at you as the individual and the state of your finances. We're looking at prepare your finances and ensure a successful home loan application process with these expert tips. So we're going to be looking at some of the tips that are going to help you navigate your home loan application process. We know so many of us probably might have their home loan declined at one place at one time or another. And perhaps you might be, you know, confused as to why that is the case. We're going to be sharing with you expert tips on what to, uh, you know, do to make sure that that doesn't happen and really things that are going to help you throughout your home loan application process. And as usual, I've brought you an expert guest who's going to help us navigate this particular topic. And this evening, I've got Barbara Mandal, who's an accountant, a tax practitioner and a financial planner, which is also a director at Barbara Mandel Consult. Barbara, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good evening and good evening to your listeners. It's a privilege to be here. It's only a pleasure, um, Barbara. I think, you know, one of the first things, you know, a lot of people right now have felt the economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis uh, in one way or another. And in the same breath, so many people want to be able to access the housing markets because we're looking at all these, you know, we're looking at historically low interest rates and people are probably thinking, how can I best take advantage of these low interest rates? And how can I best make sure that I'm able to get that home loan facility as much as possible? Perhaps take us through the first thing we should be thinking of the moment you're thinking of applying for a home loan as far as our finances are concerned. So the very first thing you need to start looking at is your credit score. Uh, Your interest rate that you will get on your bond is largely dependent on how good your credit score is. So I've prepared a couple of tips for people on how to get their credit score to a very good score. The first thing is that you have to pay on time. A day late or two days late will be noted as late paid, and that does count again against you so pay those accounts on time even a day or two beforehand if you can would be super great Uh, the next thing that a lot of people don't think about when they consider their credit record is the amount of debt they have versus the amount of assets they have so people are often have a lot of personal loans and clothing accounts cell phone accounts but they don't realize that it's seen in relation to your assets so what assets do you hold in order to be able to service that debt should you not be able to work the other thing is the number or your level of disposable income so when I say that it basically means your total income less any expenses and that your expenses include your debt repayments so the bigger you can get that disposable income to prove to the bank that even if interest rates goes up because yes that's a factor we now have historically low interest rates but people forget that when the interest rates start going up How am I going to be able to continue servicing my bond? And that's when a lot of people get in trouble is that minute the interest rate goes up, they are unable to service it because they have geared their debt so high. And, you know, Barbara, before we even go through some of, you know, the other tips uh, when it comes to the credit score, I actually want to look at uh, one of the things that you've just mentioned to us, you know, which is around the amount of debt versus your assets, because I'm sure a lot of people probably don't think quite extensively about this one, because you're thinking, well, I'm able to pay off my debt, I never miss any, uh, you know, of my payments, my debit orders never bounce. 
what would you say is kind of the, the right sweet spot? Because the reality is people are going to have some level of debt or another, whether you're paying off a car or you've got a cell phone contract, perhaps you have to take out uh, you know, a personal loan or a credit card. Um, so we find that a lot of people who are working do have some level of debt or another. What would you say is kind of the, the right sweet spot um, that isn't going to disadvantage you when it comes to your home loan application? Okay. So the first thing we need to consider is unsecured versus secured debt. So in simple terms, what that means is unsecured debt is there's nothing attached to that debt that if you don't pay it, the bank can go after. So vehicle finance and house uh, a bond is an example of secured debt because if you don't pay, they take back your car. So that's the first level. So Traditionally, your secured debt is seen as good debt because you're acquiring the assets while you're paying off the debt, while as you're unsecured as your bad debt, that's generally your lifestyle debt or getting yourself out of a crisis debt. And the problem is a lot of people might have a high debt ratio, but they've got a lot. So you might have, let's say, a 5,000 rand bond and a 2,000 rand car, um, and now you think, well, it's basically one-to-one -one if you think about your assets that you hold because that's the asset you finance, for example. You might think that's bad, but it's not because at least it's secured debt. The problem comes in when people have too much unsecured debt. So I'd also, I always recommend that where you've got secured debt together with your assets, that it's a two-to-one ratio. So double your assets in the amount of unsecured debt that you have. Mm -hmm. And that's actually just such a useful tip, you know, Barbara, because I think, especially if you look at, for example, young professionals, we start working, uh, perhaps you get that car because unfortunately a car is a necessity, you know, when you live in South Africa and you work with, I mean, if I look at a Joburg, for example, you almost can't function without a car. Um, and then it might just so happen that you maybe take that credit card because Banks also do extend that, you know, facility. And then you also find that you're very likely going to maybe have other kinds of uh, debt along the way, which, of course, can be such a huge disadvantage. Um, and I think oftentimes we very likely don't think about that, uh, which is quite unfortunate, because I think when you look at the reality of it is you might find that the only kind of, let's call it good debt that a candidate might have is probably only their car. And they've got all kinds of other uh, bad debt. So getting that balance becomes so important when you're looking at um, securing that home loan. Uh, I see a comment here coming in from YouTube. Uh, I'm so glad that we're getting YouTube on commenting uh, as much as possible. I know that we had the battle of the Insta and Facebook. So now we're going and taking it, of course, all the way to YouTube. So to our YouTube uh, viewers at home, we're also urging you to get on in the fun, uh, send your comments, questions, and also let us know when you are watching. I always love seeing all of you showing us all the love during the private property podcast uh, and we've got here Usipogazi Pigeni on YouTube saying this topic has come at just the right time thanks Zama uh, thank you very much Usipogazi I think a lot of us you know are trying to find different ways uh, we can maximize our finances especially given that we've taken this you know economic knock and really want to make sure that we you know do as well as possible in order to have that successful home loan application so Barbara you've taken us through you know, certainly the first tips were around you know, our credit score, which is such a crucial part of the home loan application process. You cannot, uh, if, if, in, if anything, this is the one thing you can't ignore. Uh, you know, the banks will check your credit score and there are certain things as you've highlighted that you can do to make sure that you have a good credit score. So one of the big things is paying on time. And I think that's the one that perhaps some people have had a difficulty with right now. And in the event where that's happened, communicate with, uh, you know, the financial institutions uh, that have extended uh, whatever facility uh, that you need to pay, because that is the thing that often sets people apart, that they don't communicate on time. So then, Barbara, what would you then say are, is sort of the next tips? Because so the first is around credit score, making sure that we safeguard that as much as possible. Yeah. So the next tip is to start saving for your transfer cost. So depending on the type of property you're purchasing and if it's your first time purchase or not, you might uh, have transfer duty. Uh, but you will definitely have conveyancing fee for the attorneys. So generally, some banks do award 100% bonds for first-time homeowners. 
um, and then they sometimes do allow those extra to cover for those charges. But that would be your next goal is to set up a goal to save for that transfer duties so that it's something you can afford to pay. And I think, you know, Barbara, transfer costs creep up on us in so many different ways. Because when you look at transfer costs, it isn't just about, you know, potentially transfer duty. Perhaps you're going to buy that property that's below a million, so you're not going to pay transfer duty. But it also includes, of course, your bond registration attorneys and your transferring attorneys. And, you know, I've shared uh, with viewers at home in previous episodes that when I, the first time I bought properties, I actually bought two properties, uh, you know, for myself for a birthday. And I had done all the research and I knew that there were attorneys that were going to be involved in the home loan process. Uh, but for some other reason, in my research, I thought there's only one attorney for, uh, you know, a property that you buy. So I had saved up a little bit of a deposit. I'd saved up for, you know, the attorney cost. I'd gotten a relative sense of how much it might cost. And then I found sort of the, you know, the properties that I wanted to buy, sign my office to purchase. And the process then starts. Then the next thing I know, I get the first invoice from the first attorney. I'm not surprised. I knew that that was coming. The second one comes. Again, I'm not surprised because I thought you're buying two properties. Of course, the second one was going to come. And then lo and behold, the third invoice comes. And then the fourth invoice comes. And my heart sank. You know, it literally took one of the attorneys sitting down and explaining to me that, no, because you're buying this property um, with a home loan, you actually have two attorneys per transaction. Um, and that is the transferring attorneys and the bond registration attorneys. And this is what they essentially do. And, and I think I was fortunate in that I was able to raise the capital and, and pay both attorneys. But unfortunately, don't plan ahead that's something that you might have difficulty yeah. with. And I think, Barbara, you know, have you found that sometimes when people haven't planned for this particular expense, you know, they end up sometimes, for example, taking, uh, you know, a home loan to, not a home loan, sorry, taking a personal loan in order to pay an attorney. So if an attorney comes to 20 or 30,000, you then end up taking a personal loan, maybe of 50,000, uh, essentially changing the nature of your financial status. Yes, most definitely they do. And the biggest problem is that um, personal loan comes at a nice hefty interest rate, uh, which you then end up paying over for the next five years. So effectively, that cost that you didn't prepare for is now in most instances costing you nearly double what it would have otherwise. The other thing that people also tend to forget is when they move into a new property, it's the nature of the habit. We want to change things. We want to change. We want to make it personal. We want to make it our own. So they don't have a bit of a buffer saved up for all these things they want to do. Some people then take credit to do it, which is, again, it's costing you almost double in certain instances. And other people just end up not doing it, become despondent. And you lose that whole vibey feeling of just bought my first property. And you lose that feeling of it's mine. It's I made it my own. So a lot of the cases people tend to forget about preparing my not just preparing my credit record and everything else it's just that saving up for things I want to do and when they look at properties they get all these ideas but they don't necessarily think of the cost of what they want to do and then they end up buying a property it costs them a hell of a lot more than they planned for in terms of what they want to do with it instead of purchasing something else where they might not have to have done so much to the property, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing that people forget is I need an emergency fund. And now I've got a property coming in. Now, as you and I spoke just briefly before the show, a lot of people don't even have an emergency fund to start off with. Now you've got this property. You now have to, oh, first, very important point is, when you plan for this purchase and you look at your budget in terms of affordability, a lot of people forget a tiny little thing called insurance. Now, when you bond a property, that insurance is compulsory. So there is an additional monthly premium that you need to make provision for. I generally recommend to people phone a couple of companies, get an indication. It's not going to be a definite amount, but get an indication more or less for a property in a specific area. What is your homeowner's insurance going to be like? Because a lot of people also then say, well, you know what? I can reduce that monthly premium, have a higher excess when I do need to claim. And then the problem is they need to claim and they don't have that 
excess available to them in their emergency fund. You know, Barbara, we're going to go for a quick break. And when we come back from the break, I want us to, you know, explore some of the mistakes that you've seen people made that has uh, made it difficult for them to secure uh, home loans, uh, especially because I think now more than ever, we're seeing a bigger interest from people in terms of accessing that home loan facility. We are also, of course, taking your questions and comments at home. I see YouTube is stepping up to the battle of the social media platforms. I haven't seen anything quite yet from Facebook. So I think the, the old crocs on Facebook do need to raise the bar just a little bit. And of course, as usual, I love how Instagram has been showing us some love. So do send through those questions when it comes to what are some of the tips that you want to you know, explore and certainly have had questions about when it comes to the home loan application process. Perhaps you've been able to save up a little bit uh, during this lockdown because you haven't been going out. Maybe you even, you know, you, you continued not going out when we moved into level two and level one. Perhaps you've been able to stay diligent and not use things like Uber Eats and you've seen that, uh, you know, increase in your disposable income just a little bit. And you're now looking at the different ways that you can access this home loan facility. Do share with us some of the things that you've been able to do to save up that little bit of money and to cut down your expenses. As Barbara has highlighted, one of the very big things is being able to save up. You know, I think one of the big things is there are going to be costs associated with getting that home the first time or even the second time around. So making sure that you are financially prepared is very crucial. Well, we're going to go for a quick break and we'll be back just after this. Welcome back to episode 126 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantu Kumalo. This evening, we're looking at how to prepare your finances so you can ensure a successful home loan application. I'm sure a lot of us at home are probably you know, looking at getting, whether it's our first home or certainly looking to get that second home. And one of the crucial things for us to get right are our finances. And to help us get expert tips on how we can best do this, I'm joined this evening by Barbara Mandel who's an accountant, a tax practitioner, a financial plan, as well as director at Barbara Mandel Consultant. Barbara, so, you know, before the break, you certainly give us the big scoop around, you know, credit score. It's always crucial. It's something that we emphasize quite a lot in the Private Property Podcast. We also speak a lot about it on the First Time Home Buyers Show. Of course, to viewers at home, the First Time Home Buyers Show is every Wednesday, just after the Private Property Podcast, where if you're a first time buyer and you want to get all the tips and tricks and tools to help you on that first home, they do tune in every Wednesday around 7.30 with SD Klassen. And, and of course, then we're also looking at, you know, looking at the ratio between your debt as well as your assets. And that sweet spot, as you're saying, probably being a two to one, because you want to make sure that you're displaying to the bank that in, in as much as you've got debt, you've, also, you've actually got good debt uh, and more good debt as opposed to that bad debt. But now, Barbara, I actually want to perhaps explore certain mistakes. Before we even get to some of the questions and comments from viewers at home, perhaps take us through some of the mistakes that you've seen uh, you know, some of your clients perhaps making when it comes to their home loan application process that has probably even hindered them uh, either getting a home loan or perhaps ending up being charged quite a high interest rate on their home loan facility. So one of the things is um, that they've got a lot of credit, but it's non-active credit, if I can put it that way. So they might have credit cards with huge limits that they're not using, but the bank is still looking at it. It's available to them. And what if they maximize that credit? Um, what would their debt ratio be then? So 
golden rule, if you don't use it, it doesn't form part of your emergency plan, ditch it, get rid of it, cancel it. There's um, awesome facilities called revolving credit facilities. People mm. can use those very uh, frequently because it encourages you to pay it all faster because then you can have access to more money. So um, people tend to keep that. The biggest thing is the credit card because some of them have got quite high um, credit limits. It's yeah. not that people use it. Um, interest rates as well, it's pretty high. Um, and then as I said, when they apply for the bond, the bank looks at, but you're, you've got all this money available to you. Even though you might not use it, you might use it after we've applied for the bond. The second thing that people do is they're not totally honest with the bank in terms of their income and expenses. So banks are like SARS or like Interpol nowadays. They know everything about you. <laughs> Okay, SARS knows everything. The same with banks. They've got yeah. ways and means. They all connected. They find out things about you. They are going to know if you're being dishonest. They are going to know if you're not displaying the full truth. So, and most times when they decline your home loan, it's not necessarily because of affordability. It's because you were dishonest and they can't trust the information that they, can, that they received from you. Another big mistake that my clients especially make is their taxes is not up to date. Now, before you apply for a bond, if your tax is not up to date, you're not going to get the approval for the transfer. Yep. So a lot of people <laughs> think or assume or go ostrich with their taxes. Um, and unfortunately, it's a simple thing to do. But it does take time, especially if SARS decides we're going to audit you. It might be a 69 today. You're... The per person you bought the per property from might say, well, you're taking too long now. We'll be considering our options. And you might lose the property, something as silly as your taxes. Mm. You know, Barbara, when you mentioned taxes, I was smiling because I've had that experience uh, from both sides. You know, I think there was actually, and this is probably an embarrassing thing to, to admit, but I, you know, my, when I started working, I, I see you, Sammy, my slides, they say good evening there with those uh, green hearts. I know Sammy is one of the, uh, the ring leaders on Facebook and making sure that he gets together the, the Facebook gang when we do the battle of the social media platform. So it's great to see you there, Sammy. Uh, Martha saying, Sammy, yay, she doesn't, um, she doesn't notice us anymore because of her new babes on Insta. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that, Martha. Of course, I'm going to show you love on Facebook as well. Uh, I see Samuel also saying Zama and Instagram. <laughs> you know what? I think the only way is to give me the attention. I go where the attention is given. So Instagram is showing quite a lot of attention. So Facebook needs to do the same thing. Then, of course, I'll always give you that love. I'm certainly not going to, uh, you know, ditch the, the, the old guys, the old timers that I'm used to. Uh, if anything, you've become like those friends that you've had for a long time and now you've got these new friends that you're spending a little bit of time with because you're also getting to know them. Uh, and sometimes your old friends might feel like, hmm, they're not getting the same amount of attention. So don't worry. I certainly have not forgotten about you. If anything, I want the new friends to get to where we are because we've now gotten closer. There's quite a bit that you guys now know even about me. Um, and on those things, you know, I was saying, Barbara, that one of the mistakes I've made, I mean, there was certainly a time, luckily this was before I started, you know, applying for a home loan. I do started working and I think the first year after working you know I, I did my tax returns as normal actually went to a house branch everything was great and then I think the second and the third year I didn't submit my tax returns and at the time there was no additional income it was just the job that I was doing and I think my rationale was also a I went to varsity nobody told me to you know do my tax returns I already see my tax money being taken every month I don't understand why I need to do this. And then third year, uh, luckily I got an accountant and that's when I started getting into property. And luckily I was able to actually get the property without it you know, saying I haven't um, you know, done tax returns for two years. But the year she had to submit my tax returns, uh, SARS had to give me back some money. It held it back because I hadn't submitted for those two prior years. So then luckily my accountant got in it, got the taxes done. It was very quick and efficient. I was able to get my money. But the flip side of it is 
I've had a property transaction delay because the seller uh, hadn't done his taxes properly. So that wasn't clearing. So that ended up being quite a long delay on our end. And I think on top of that, there were things with the municipality. So it was just such a long process. We actually ended up having that transaction take nearly five months because they needed to sort out their finances. So I think it's so important for both parties, not just the buyer to make sure that they you know, have their tax affairs in order. I know I've shared with you know, viewers at home that I don't do my own taxes. I have an accountant who is brilliant. I've been getting audited every year, I think for the past three years, I always have a clean audit. And I don't think I would have been able to get that clean audit if I was doing it myself. So I think it's very important that you're able to work with professionals like Barbara or other tax practitioners when it comes to property. Because so many of us, don't know how this works. And I always say to people, I didn't do accounting. I don't understand tax in this context. So I get a professional to work with me as much as possible. But of course, we are taking your questions and comments, whether you're on YouTube, Insta, or of course, the old friends on Facebook, do send them through, um, especially when it comes to you know, your finances uh, during the home loan application process. I see a regular here, Martha Shingani, saying uh, that a deposit for your residual, uh, for the residential house is very key the bank can offer you a better rate based on that try to put something in and that's such an important one because you want to make sure that uh you know you are um you have the then you're able to better negotiate that interest rate as Martha has pointed out. I see we've got live here on YouTube. I love seeing the YouTube guys also step up a bit. I think we must nudge them a bit more um, as well. And on YouTube, we've got uh, Shandi Sean saying, hi, private property, hope you're well. I spoke to my bank and I would like to fix my interest rate, but they said I can only fix it after five years. Is that true? And why is it like that? Barbara, are you able to, to comment on that one, fixing your interest rates and perhaps your financial institution saying, look, we're not going to fix it just yet. Perhaps in the future, uh, we might be able to fix it. Yeah. So with certain type, different types of um, lending, there is different types of rules. So generally with property, they don't fix it within the first five years because it is a long-term outlook. Um, they don't necessarily want to commit now to a 20-year term, on a, especially now at interest rates of 7-8%. Um, but do you note that on bonds, when they do fix the interest rates, it's not for the full term. It's generally renewable in five-year periods. That's why they can't do it in the first year. When you do uh, vehicle finance, for instance, yes, then they can fix it for the full up to six years. Uh, we will give you a, a, a fixed interest rate. And we've got another um, comment here from Manzi Laike in Jamela. This one is coming from Facebook. Uh, he's saying, uh, still under credit scoring, some credit providers don't remove your name from the credit bureau, even after you have settled the debt, such as a judgment. And have you seen that, Barbara? Because it, it, yeah. you know, I've absolutely heard quite a number of people, uh, they've long paid off that particular debt, but when they do their credit scoring, they find that it's still actually reflecting on their profile. Yes, definitely. The worst is actually people who went under debt review. And after the debt review, the a uh, debt counselor didn't do their job properly and didn't inform the credit bureaus accordingly. A lot of creditors don't necessarily update, especially where there's judgments involved uh, or when there's some sort of special arrangement. The career bureaus doesn't get updated automatically. So your normal debt, month to month, they've got a what they call a data transfer every month to all the career bureaus, and that happens automatically. So here's my tips for people who struggle with that. First of all, Get the letter from the creditor that has been paid up. Mm. Secondly, get the details of all the credit bureaus where you are getting negative results and send that letter to them directly. They, by law, have to update it within 10 business days. Okay. They have to update your credit record. Um, a lot of them, when you do apply for your credit record, they will ask you seeing a mistake. Are you seeing a mistake on your credit record reported here now? But a lot of them don't take action on it necessarily. You have to be very much proactive in getting those paid up letters. If the credit provider or the credit bureau is at or and or credit provider is not cooperating with you, even though you've done or they don't want to provide you with a letter or you're struggling to get the letter, remember the national credit regulators there to protect you. Okay. 
there is a compliance procedure on their website. Go there, lay a complaint. As South Africans, we very quick to say, this is wrong and this is wrong, but we don't always want to take formal steps to complain. Now, my philosophy is if someone doesn't know it's wrong, how are they going to fix it? So that's the first thing. If they're not cooperating with you, complain within. If they don't fix it, complain to the regulator. That's what they're there for. Banks pay a special levy that's worked into your charges every month to the credit regulator for that service. Make use of it. We've got a, a, another question here, this one coming from our new friends on Instagram, and this one is coming from Lichen Cylinder, who says, how can I improve my finances as a teenager? Uh, love you. Uh, thank you there very much, uh, Lichen. I, I love seeing teenagers being interested in, uh, you know, in property, which is actually something that is very interesting and very good, and you already want to improve the state of your finances that early on. So what can teenagers do? Uh, they're already thinking, oh, I'm interested in property what can they do probably maybe they're getting allowance at home uh how can they probably best kind of think about uh property so that by the time they're ready to to take that leap uh, they're ready and well equipped okay so there's two things save 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 and so the, the more you save the better but then also get that entrepreneurial spirit going invest in a couple of business not all your money Just keep some saved in a in a savings account earning a decent interest um, but then also remember fixed term interest. So if you fix your money for a longer period of term, you'll earn a high interest rate. But then do double in some of the entrepreneurial spirits. Uh, um, have a look at some ways to make money, um, even if it's just washing or studying or doing working part time. Get earn that extra money. Um, mm. Invest in something if you have to. But the best thing advice, especially for teenagers, is save as much as you can. Okay, and we've got a one here from Facebook, and this one is coming from Umuluzi Samuel Makohwane, who asks, uh, what is the importance of keeping your install installment as is, even when interest rates have gone down? So there's a beautiful benefit if you keep your installments as is, and that is that you're paying less interest over the time because every portion that you of your payment repayment that you make that does not go to servicing the interest gets allocated to your capital. So that means your outstanding balance every month come down quite significantly. Now, we've seen some people who've added an additional 200 Rand a month on their car repayment and they've paid off the, your, their car a year quicker. That brings me to something very important that's quite a nifty tip. When your bond is approved, that very as soon as your bond account's been opened with the bank, Try and make one your first installment immediately after it's been opened because that full installment comes off your capital directly and you immediately start saving interest. Uh, we've got a, a you know quite a um a, a longish comment here from U uh Mandila Ken Jamela who says still under credit scoring. The financial institutions basically look in depth on three areas of which any either of them can cause the application to be declined. The first, certainly as Barbara has mentioned, is around your credit history. So looking at whether um, you have any defaults, judgments, administrations, or garnish under your name. Uh, then secondly is the credit scoring, which can be viewed as low, medium, or high risk uh, since the institutions don't know you. So they use the scoring as a criteria to measure how you collectively manage and conduct one's credit behavior as a whole. And thirdly, affordability with respect to the new home loan application, whether from the income, when all the expenses are taken, uh, whether or not you'll be able to afford. And that's a really you know, great way of also just capturing what we were speaking about earlier, that you want to understand where the financial institutions are looking, how your credit score is essentially measured, because then that helps you, uh, you know, mitigate if you're perhaps over indebted. So you're probably going to want to pay off um, that debt, especially during this period, because interest rates are low. So perhaps between now and let's say the next eight months if longer you prioritize paying off your debt as much as possible so that you give yourself better odds when you start applying from that uh, home loan uh, i see another regular here i love doing battle of the social media platforms because facebook steps up instagram has been stepping up today youtube is also stepping up so i think i'm going to keep this uh, up if anything we're probably going to do a whichever social media platform gives us the most engagement 
that is probably going to win a prize. So I'm certainly going to speak to the team and find a way to reward the platform that has the most engagement. I see Martha saying private property, yay. We will uh, let it slide under the package on the new babies has been removed. <laughs> Martha, I think, you know, one of the big things is, I think once the new friends have gotten used to it, I mean, the, the Instagram guys haven't even seen us do giveaways. They don't know how much we love giving away money or data, or even, of course, our books. I see Sammy also joining in there saying, Martha Shingange ish, but we forgive her. I hope you do if anything this is a, a great battle we want to see who's going to win who's going to give us the most engagement and i promise you from next week we're actually going to start rewarding the social media platform that gives us the most engagement uh, and we'll see which one it is i think if the old the facebook guys you guys know how we do so we'll see how this one goes i think the instagram guys might want to uh probably win this one to prove that even though they're the new kids on the block they are still they have their finger on the pulse uh we've got bonds uh sabakwe and i is can one get a tax number from outside the country? So it depends. For you, if you're not a South African citizen, to get a tax number, you will need to have assets in South Africa, um, which is a double-edged sword because if you're looking to buy a property, you need a tax number, but you can't get the tax number if you don't have assets within South Africa. So, yes. Um, you can, you'll have to apply, but you will need either assets or earn an income from South Africa. Okay. Uh, Instagram stepping up yet again. We've got a question here from Ms. Fangu, who says, how long does it usually take to receive feedback from the seller once you've signed the OTP? That depends on your estate agent. <laughs> so the, it, 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 hung, it depends on how active your estate agent is and how active they are in the process. Um, some estate agent gets back to you as, uh, within two or three days. Some of them takes a week. Um, that really depends on your estate agents and the, the, the seller. We are certainly seeing, uh, I'm seeing we've got more viewers on our YouTube channel, which is fantastic. That means more people are, you know, getting a sense of how this battle of the social media platforms is going to go. And this time we've got another question here from YouTube, uh, from Arno van Denver, um, who says, will you get a better credit score if you use more than one credit card and pay those, and pay those uh, every month? So yes, the more active credit accounts you have, the better, as long as the total credit you've got available is not too high according to your availability, uh, your affordability. Um, okay, I, I, and, and that's actually just such an important one. I think sometimes people uh, might get perhaps one too many you know, credit cards. So you also do just want to get a sense of um, your, what your credit exposure is as much as possible. I'm going to take one here from uh, Facebook. And this one is coming from Ulebohan Nguana, who says, what advice would you give somebody who wants to buy a property cash? It depends for what purpose. If you want to buy property cash for normal residential purpose, yeah, it's a good thing. Um, just make sure that you do have insurance because let's say you don't have insurance and something does happen, your, your property burns down, then all your, your savings is, is down the drain. So that's very important. With a home loan, they do force you to have that insurance So uh, because that's to protect themselves. Um, if you are doing it for letting or renting out purposes, then I would say rather consider financing a portion of it because there is tax advantages available to that. Um, you can deduct the interest on the repayments for that from your taxes. So it all depends on your personal um, circumstances, but definitely if it's residential for your own purposes, good idea. Yeah, I was actually going to add that, Barbara, that, you know, certainly as property investors, we know not to buy a, the whole property cash because you want to be able to get those tax benefits uh, in the event where you have it financed. So some will probably put down a, a decent uh, deposit so that you get your LTV at a good uh, level. So that's your loan to value. Um, but you certainly wouldn't put the full amount down as cash for some of the rental properties. I'm going to take a last question this time from uh, Instagram. And this one is coming uh, from Walker John 007. And uh, they ask, if a bond is rejected by the bank, how long after can we reapply if the debts are settled? 
and uh, simultaneous. So essentially, if you've now settled the, you know, the debts, um, how long and since you've essentially been rejected by the bank? So a lot of the banks will reconsider your application after three months. Um, a lot of them in that rejection letter will tell you, listen, we are willing to look at this after a three month period or after a six month period, um, but generally between three to six months. Also, what you don't want to do, just touching back, back on uh, credit scoring, is remember every time you make a credit inquiry, it increases or decreases your credit score. So a lot of people just before they um, are looking at getting a bond, they test their credit record with applying for credit. Um, so that might be something you want to stay clear of. Rather get your credit record. There's a lot of apps. Um, there's Clear Score. There's Time Bank. It's got a pretty nice uh, credit scoring app. There's a lot of the apps that you can use to access your credit score frequently. Um, I know FNB has launched something similar. Most of the banks have got access to your credit score if you just ask them. So avoid applying for credit just to see is my credit score good. Rather get your official copy. You can get it from the credit bureaus free of charge once a year. Other than that, they do charge. But as I say, the market has evolved so much. There's a lot of people that's offering you access to your credit score 24-7 for free. Barbara, before I let you go, any final tips for our viewers at home when it comes to making sure that they have a successful home loan application process? Get all your documents, order, save as much as you can and make sure those taxes are up to date. Uh, and we're going to leave it there. And if you want to get your taxes uh, up to date, of course, you're able to reach out to Barbara uh, as well as other tax practitioners, because that's certainly something that's going to be important. Uh, I see Sammy saying that I'm the ring leader. Sammy, you certainly, I see you riling up the troops there on Facebook. So I do hope that uh, you're going to get them together when we run that competition to see uh, which social media platform is going to give us the most engagement. We're going to reward you for engaging with us. I think that's probably a nice way to, to see who's here, you know, and, and who's engaging us and showing us that love. Well, we're going to leave it there this evening on the Private Property Podcast. It certainly has been a pleasure. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. It was an absolute honor and time flew by. It was so much fun. It certainly did fly by. I think this is what happens. You know, they always say time flies when you're having fun, especially if you're having fun with friends, whether it's old friends from Facebook and YouTube, or of course, new friends from Instagram. So it has been a pleasure to be with all of you from Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Of course, let's keep the conversation going on our social media platforms. And as usual, if there's any topic that you still want us to cover, you want us to go back to, or perhaps you think we didn't spend enough time on this particular issue, then do drop us the comment below and we'll make sure that we bring the right expert to help us you know dig deeper into that topic well for me Zamandunga Kumalo it has been a pleasure to be with you this evening of course we're back again tomorrow evening it is a Wednesday so we're going to have APSA with us so do make sure that you stay tuned for that as is usual hope you're staying home and staying safe
Hi, I'm Mohamed Zaboy, and I'm an entrepreneur from Soweto. Soweto's come a long way, from a small township to a mini city of its own. Soweto's got some really, really nice suburbs, like Deep Cliff Extension, but the locals call it Deep Cliff Expensive. Orlando is known as the suburb that had the first brick houses built in Soweto. Orlando Stadium for its iconic games between Kaiser Chiefs and Pirates. And most importantly, Villa Gaza Street, where Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu resided. To the west of Soweto, you find suburbs of Dobsonville and Protea. These two suburbs are actually very cosmopolitan, fresh, young, and very new. Right next door to Soweto, we have a neighboring suburb, which is Aldorado Park. For a little adventure and a little fun, Soweto's got so many night spots, from the news cafe at Mamponya Mall, to your Velagazi streets at Kumzi's, to just chilling at Chafpozi just between the towers and having a simple braai face, Chisanyama. Something very close to my heart is actually seeing people move back into Soweto, growing businesses, remodeling homes. It merely says to us that Soweto is a growing city. There's way more to this place than what we think. Soweto needs to be discovered daily. I'm so proud to call Soweto my home, and this is my neighborhood.